Within the southern desert tribes of the Sahara, a quiet revolution was starting to take place. A revolution that would change the face of the region in ways no one could have predicted. From the desert lands, a group of mysterious veiled warriors would burst out of their homelands and build an immense empire, stretching from the Senegal River to the Andalusian Plains. They are known as the al muravits from the Arabic word al murabbitun by their desire to revitalize Islam throughout the region. Armed with nothing more than their faith and an unyielding resolve, the al muravits shook the region forever. The man who started it all was Yahya ibn Ibrahim, the leader of the Gudala subtribe of Senhaja. Feeling the general decay of the religion in the region, Yahya started to look for a knowledgeable person, someone who could help him revitalize Islam as the ruling force. On his way back from pilgrimage in Mecca, he stopped by al Kairuan, where he met Abu Imran al-Fassi, a scholar of the Maliki school. Yahya was impressed by the scholar's manners, piety, and asceticism. The scholar sent him to one of his students in the regions of Sus, called Wajjaj al-Lamti. Wajjaj, in turn, assigned his own student, Abdullah ibn Yasin, to help out Yahya in his mission. Abdullah ibn Yasin was like Yahya ibn Ibrahim from the Gudala tribe. He had spent seven years studying in Al-Andalus under several renowned Maliki scholars. And just like that, this partnership laid the foundation of the al muravids with Abdullah ibn Yasin as the ultimate religious authority. Abdullah put himself to task, starting with the tribes of Lamtuna and Gudala, and taught them the fundamentals of the religion. But his religious zeal and strict enforcement of the Islamic rulings started to make him enemies. Abdullah's only option left was to flee and save his life. What happens next is blurry in history books and varies from one source to the next. There is, however, a narration that can be found in both Tariq ibn Khaldun and Ibn Abidar's Raud al Girtas, in which Yahya tells Abdullah about an island located on the river of Senegal where they could live and worship in peace. The word spread, and soon after, the Al Muravids were 1,000 men strong. The armed struggle had begun. In a rapid succession of events, the Berber tribes fall into al Muravid rule, one after the other. In 1053, they took control of the desert city of Odegost. In 1054, scholars from Sijil Masa sent a call to help for Abdullah ibn Yasin to rid them of their unjust rulers. The call is answered in the same year as the al Muravids sweep in and take over the area. In 1055, the Maghrawa region was the next region to fall. Yahya ibn Ibrahim dies in circumstances that are not clear, and Abdullah ibn Yasin places Yahya ibn Umar as leader. However, things are about to take a turn for the worse. A group of rebels break out in Gudala and Sijj al -Masa. Yahya ibn Umar and Abdullah ibn Yasin are forced to split their troops. As a result, Yahya ibn Umar is killed in 1056 in the Battle of Tabfarilla, which is arguably the first significant defeat of the al Muravids. His brother, Abu Bakr ibn Umar, eventually launches a campaign to pacify the last rebellions in the Sahara Desert. By now, they have managed to control most of the unrest across western North Africa, but are faced with a significant challenge, the Kingdom of Buraghwata. To give some context, we have to go further back in time. In 744 CE, during the caliphate of Hisham ibn Abd al-Malik, a self-professed prophet of a new Judeo-Christian religion by the name of Sali ibn Tarif started to spread his newfound religion in the region of Damasna. According to Ibn Khaldun, Salih ibn Tarif claimed to have received a new revelation from God, containing 80 chapters, from which some were named after famous prophets like Adam and Noah a.s. In his religion, his followers would fast the month of Rajab instead of Ramadan. They would pray 10 daily prayers instead of the required 5. The kingdom boasted a very powerful military force of over 20,000 men. For a long period of time, it managed to thwart any attempt at taking their lands, 
It was also ruled by a succession of strong leaders who saw to the prosperity of the kingdom. None of them were interested in military conquests. Instead, they preferred strengthening trade and diplomacy. They also consolidated all the tribes in the kingdom, enabling a long period of peace in their lands. Abdullah ibn Yasin and the Almoravids, now armed with a strong religious zeal and a stronger army, shifted their attention to the kingdom, determined to erase from the Maghrib any trace of this blasphemous religion. And so, in 1059, the Almoravids were at the doors of the infamous kingdom. The battle broke out. Abdullah ibn Yasin, the spiritual leader, suffered heavy injuries. As he was carried back to his war camp, he called on the senior members of the Almoravids and uttered what would be his final words. Help one another for the sake of Allah. Do not fight or compete for leadership, for Allah grants dominion to whom he wills. Choose my successor, from whom you are pleased, one that will lead your armies, fight your enemies, establish the prayer, and fulfill the zakat. The battle was bigger than anything the Almoravids had faced before, but they were not ones to be easily deterred. They pushed through and managed to defeat their opponents, marking the definitive end of the kingdom of Buraghwata. A new period was ushered in. Abu Bakr ibn Umar, one of the senior members, was the new appointed leader. In 1061, as further rebellions broke out in the Saharan tribes, he decided to go back and pacify the region. In his absence, he appointed Yusuf ibn Tashfin, the best and most trusted man to lead the northern part of the empire. Yusuf was a hardened warrior from the desert. He was used to a somewhat rugged life and had no love for the luxury and extravagances that the Muslim emirs of Spain indulged in. He considered them weak, having more love for their lavish lifestyle than for the afterlife, to the point where they would fight each other for territory, even allying with Christians against fellow Muslims in some cases. Yusuf was different. His asceticism and love for the afterlife were a direct result of Abdullah ibn Yasin's teachings. Now that we understand a bit about who Yusuf ibn Tashfin was, let's get back to the main story. Abu Bakr ibn Umar was getting ready to depart to the Sahara to settle issues between his homeland tribes. In the absence of Abu Bakr, Yusuf ibn Tashfin would shine in strategic, military, and administrative tasks of the empire. Meanwhile, Abu Bakr was pacifying the last rebellions and protecting the south frontiers from the empire of Ghana. Once these matters settled, he came back to the north, expecting to take over the lead from Yusuf. But he didn't. It appears Yusuf prepared a welcome back ceremony for Abu Bakr's return, one worthy of kings. The two leaders met and dismounted, and the two men sat to discuss the future of al Muravid rule. Abu Bakr allegedly told Yusuf, O oh Yusuf, you are my brother in faith and the son of my uncle. I do not see a better fit than yourself for the leadership of the country, and I myself long to return to our desert homelands. I only came to hand the power over to you. Then I shall be on my way. These two leaders were exemplary patrons of Islam, displaying a high standard of morals and exceptional behavior towards one another. With Western North Africa pacified under al Muravid rule, Doors open up for them elsewhere, as the Spanish Muslim kingdoms facing the northern Christian kingdoms seek the aid of the Almoravids, what would follow would redefine Spanish Muslim history. Stay tuned for the next part, where we cover the Almoravid campaigns in Spain. We need your support to continue making animated Islamic history accessible to all. Your contribution, starting at just $1 per month, goes a long way in fueling the passion and dedication we put into our content. Pledge your support by clicking the link on our Patreon page.